Bonjour tout le monde. Thus far, my Fire Emblem video projects on YouTube have focused more on stuff like story and characters, and who might be S-ranking whom when the players and their avatars aren't looking. I fully admit that I'm far from a tactical expert, so when I do delve into gameplay analysis, I'm more likely to do so from the perspective of a completionist. That's not a mentality that's traditionally been very applicable to Fire Emblem, but fortunately for me, the latest entry in the series did something radically different. And by that I mean New Game Plus. The school stuff was a big shakeup to gameplay too, but there's just something about the in-game journal feature that really encourages replayability, because it allows you to essentially build your units over multiple runs. That makes the concept of 100% completion for three houses much bigger than is usual for this series, where that's typically just meant grinding out the support log and filling up the music gallery and such. That's all here too, of course. But thanks to New Game Plus, it's feasible, if still rather ridiculously time-consuming, to master all classes and max out all skill ranks with each of the game's 40 playable characters. I'm not going to go over the parameters of Three Houses 100% in much more detail, though, because I've already covered that extensively in a number of blog posts on the subject, and also made my complete organizational notes and guide available on my Patreon. You can find those linked in the description below, but in this series of videos, I'm going to be applying that 100% mentality to tiering the game's characters. I made a tier list for Three Houses 100% a few months ago on my blog, but I thought it would be fun to explore the idea more in video form. Go more into my reasoning, update it based on more recent runs, stuff like that. Plus, tier lists are a fairly easy and entertaining type of video content, and it's as good a way as any for me to branch out into gameplay discussion even if the specific type of gameplay here is a bit unusual. I highly doubt most people would care enough to put in the kind of effort needed to 100% the game like this, but I think if you're just looking for a unit evaluation for casual playthroughs, you'll probably get something out of this project too. Unlike pretty much every other Fire Emblem tier list out there, this one won't be positing that you should almost always use the top tiers and avoid the bottom tiers, because the very nature of 100% requires you to use all units about equally. Rather, what I'm measuring here is how much effort will be needed to max out each unit. The higher tier units will require very little thought overall and almost take care of themselves, whereas you'll have to do a fair amount of planning to do the same with the lower tier units, and in one particularly bad case, you'll very likely have to plan entire runs around one single character. I'll get to that in time, though. Suffice it to say that this tier list will be unlike any other one for Three Houses on YouTube because I'm using very different metrics to judge units. Availability matters a fair bit for these purposes, for one thing, although here it's more about availability in a macro multi-root sense, instead of just the Fire Emblem standard of units joining earlier in the game being better than those who join later. Skill proficiencies, the areas where units are strong or weak when training, are the other really big factor, and I'm going to go into a lot of detail on those as I go along. Some other parameters are more or less relevant than is usual on other tier lists because of the conditions of this project, namely that I'm discussing normal mode with all DLC and, obviously, almost all in New Game Plus, which I've noticed doesn't enjoy a great reputation among Three Houses' more hardcore players. I've never quite liked how Fire Emblem's lower difficulties are often completely ignored when people talk about gameplay, because while the gameplay may be nowhere near as demanding as it is on Maddening and similar modes, it's also far less restrictive which works perfectly with the 100% goals of maxing out skills and mastering all classes. This is the kind of playstyle to try out all your goofy out there character builds, your great knight Lysithias and mage dedus and so forth, because while they still won't be great to use in combat, normal mode is a lot more forgiving of that kind of broad experimentation. Speaking of unconventional mages though, I should also mention that spell lists are a notable factor when it comes to ranking units. Because while poor physical performance can be made up for with strong forged weapons, there's really no way around some character's awful spell list. The same can't be said though for combat arts. In Maddening, arts like Swift Strikes and Point Blank Volley go a long way toward distinguishing units, but in Normal, most combat arts have limited use past early game, since your units will quickly outpace the enemies and reach a point where most of them can consistently double and one-round most opponents with standard attacks. There are a few exceptions, and I'll make note of them as we go along, but for the most part, combat arts don't come into play much here. With all that out of the way, though, let's get into the characters. I'll be following the in-game roster order, which for this first video means I'll be covering three houses, four lead characters, starting with Byleth. 
Byleth stands out as radically distinct from the rest of the cast in a number of ways, and for today's purposes, I'm not talking about them being a silent player self-insert. I will be talking about them being gender variable, because that does come into play here, but for the most part, I've only got nice things to say about this game's avatar. Training Byleth outside of combat is a totally different process from the other characters, and not only is the faculty training they can do during exploration noticeably faster than classroom instruction, this also means that Byleth doesn't have to worry about staying motivated to learn like everyone else. What's more, training Byleth actively improves all your other characters, because during lectures they'll get a plus two bonus to their skill gain if Byleth has a higher rank than they do. These two facts alone make Byleth an easy S tier. In fact, the only S-tier character, because it doesn't get any better than not having to rely on the same finite resources as everyone else and making all your other characters better in the process. The only real challenge with Byleth will be balancing their training with your stores of renown, because in earlier runs you won't have enough to build up their ranks every time if you've been spending a lot of time with faculty training, especially when you still need enough left over to spend on other characters. This is why I think it's better to be more sparing with faculty training at first, and to focus the training Byleth receives into more important skills, most notably authority. This brings me to talking about skills, and while individual ranks aren't as important with Byleth as they are for other characters, this is still a good time for me to explain some of the key points. Byleth is one of five characters fortunate enough to have only boons and no banes, which really helps because generally speaking, a bane is more detrimental than a boon is beneficial. This also gives Byleth a very high net proficiency, a term I use to describe the sum of a character's boons minus their banes, with budding talents counting as boons in this case. Byleth's is 4, which is excellent since most other characters sit in the 1-3 to three range. While net proficiency makes for a neat little numerical summary of a character's skill ranks though, it's also important to note that not all skills are created equal. The fewer classes a skill is attached to, the more valuable it becomes, because fewer classes means less time where a character can train in that skill without just sitting in the same class grinding it to max. This means that skills like brawling, heavy armor, and flying are considerably more important, for boons and banes, than skills like swords, lances, and axes. In light of this, the only boon of Byleth that's really helpful is brawling, although the budding talent in Faith is useful too, as of the two magic ranks, Faith is boosted by fewer classes. Authority, meanwhile, is in a weird spot, where it's the skill least tied to the class system, but is still a big priority, because as I explain in my guides, one of the best ways to increase skill growth in combat is to make good use of the adjunct system. Adjuncts gain class and skill experience at the same rate as frontline characters, but they can't gain authority, so it's best to rush authority to S+, plus as quickly as possible so you can freely use your units as backliners. This will effectively double everyone's skill growth, because you won't have to spread out kills and other sources of experience as much when you're only fielding, say, three frontliners versus five or six. Byleth's authority boon is definitely helpful in that regard, although more for training up other characters, because they're force deployed on all story maps and paralogues, and as such can't really take advantage of the adjunct system as well themselves. Byleth does also have the minor issue of having the highest number of classes to master of any character at 42. For reference, all other non-leader characters have between 35 and 37 to master, so it's a noticeable increase. This is because the two genders of Byleth are treated as one character by the in-game journal, and of course together they'll need to master all of the gender-locked classes. I'm not complaining about this though, because that's much better than having to max out all skill ranks and master all unisex classes twice with both genders of Byleth, and it also allows them to get around some of the gender-based limitations with skills and classes that other characters face and that we'll be talking about more later. Provided you're sparing with faculty training until you've built up enough renown and use Byleth's gender variability to your advantage whenever possible, it's easy to see why they're by far the best character in the game for the purposes of 100%. Now let's get into the house leaders, starting with the Flame Emperor herself, Edelgard. In case you were wondering whether this video's thumbnail was just clickbait, nope, it's completely true. The house leaders are all in D tier. Why, you ask? Simply put, it's a matter of availability or to put it in other terms, root exclusivity. All of the house leaders are, understandably, locked to their own roots and cannot be recruited outside of them, which places them at a considerable disadvantage compared to their non-root locked classmates. You'll be much more restricted in how much time and resources you can devote to developing these characters, 
And for Edelgard, that's made even worse by the fact that she's locked to Crimson Flower, by far the worst route in the game for 100% completion. It's a full three or four chapters shorter than the other routes, and moreover, it has three exclusive characters who will naturally have to monopolize the limited playtime available to them, which snowballs into the route just being a generally awful experience that you'll want to run as little as possible for the sake of literally every other character in the game. Crimson Flower may be a short, punchy route where you conquer a continent and genocide some dragons, but it does not play nicely with the completionist mentality. It shouldn't surprise you then that Edelgard is easily the worst of the house leaders, but if you look at her skill ranks, it's not all bad. She's got an above average net proficiency of 3, and she does enjoy that heavy armor boon even if her two unique classes boosting it aren't so hot because they still have less movement than Great Knight. And also Emperor has the worst availability of any class in the game at just 2 calendar months, so have fun with that. Her banes are not very well placed however. All of the Crimson Flower exclusives have Faith Banes, appropriately, which as mentioned with Byleth is the harder of the two Magic Banes to deal with. Edelgard does have the advantage of being one of the only characters with Faith Banes to have a Faith spell list that doesn't completely suck thanks to Seraphim, so that's nice. What's less nice is her Bane and Bows, the second worst physical weapon Bane to have because for training purposes it's just Archer, Sniper, and Bow Knight, as well as Assassin if you want to play it that way. She can't do much with her authority boon either, because like all of the house leaders, she's forced to play it on a lot of maps, but at least it's one less thing to worry about. One small but significant perk Edelgard does enjoy, however, is that she's not, strictly speaking, locked to Crimson Flower. She can and certainly should be trained in the classroom during the first half of your Silver Snow runs, which can allow her to do all the things that classroom exclusive training is good for, like building up her problem areas ahead of runs where they'll be needed, or finishing off skills she didn't quite max out in an earlier run. As I talk about in my guides and posts on Three Houses 100%, classroom training is not something to be overlooked, for any character, but especially for the ones who struggle in the availability department. Dimitri, on the other hand, isn't the greatest example of good classroom training opportunities, but let's start with the good stuff. It's no question that being locked to Azure Moon is a much better deal than being locked to Crimson Flower, because even though Dimitri's also sharing his exclusive availability with two other characters, Azure Moon gives them and everyone else much more time to train to their heart's content. You could argue that Dimitri doesn't take full advantage of that time because he's unavailable for non-combat development from the start of Part 2 until he undergoes his character development, but that's honestly not a massive drawback. His class experience gain will be unaffected because you can only gain class experience in combat anyway, and as long as you ensure that he's got or can get the ranks to certify for all his target classes before the time skip, Dimitri being unavailable for lectures is more of an inconvenience than a serious detriment. Now, in terms of skill ranks, I would describe Dimitri as the most average of the house leaders, in the sense that none of his boons or banes are very impactful. He's even got a net proficiency of 2, which is the lowest of the house leaders, and just about is the average overall. We've already talked about how the core melee weapon triangle skills are not a huge deal, simply because they each have so many associated classes, and riding is by a fair margin the least important movement type skill, just because there are so many classes, and indeed three master classes that boost it. Oftentimes, characters will max their riding while they're working on other skills like bows and the magic ranks. Unlike with Heavy Armor where you'll have to grind it out in Great Knight, or Flying for Males where they'll have to do the same in Wyvern Lord. Dimitri's Reason Bane is a bit more annoying, in large part because his spell list is tiny, but as with his Axe Bane, he'll have a good number of opportunities to push through that. To put it in perspective, male characters have four classes that grant plus three Reason, Warlock, Dark Bishop, Mortal Savant, and Dark Knight, but only half as many that grant plus three Faith, Bishop and Holy Knight you'll really feel that difference when working around Banes. As for Dimitri's unique classes, they're just kind of there. High Lord and Great Lord boost Swords, Lances, and Authority, just like the regular Lord class that all the House Leaders share. They're pretty mediocre, honestly. At least Edelgard's unique classes give her more time to work on Heavy Armor, even if she shouldn't stay in them long term. Claude, on the other hand, is kind of amazing, at least by House Leader standards. He's the only character locked to Verdant Wind, which by a matter of a single week in the last chapter is the longest route in the game ahead of Azure Moon, and thus he enjoys a ton of availability that he's not forced to share with any other character. 
He's also got the best net proficiency of the house leaders, courtesy of his six boons. I find it rather funny that his in-game introduction screen leaves off his riding boon, presumably because there's only room for four of them in that box, but I assure you that it's there. Fittingly, Claude's most valuable boons are the two associated with his unique classes, bows and flying, and in fact, he's also the only male character to have more than two flying classes available to him, which is definitely a plus. His banes are another matter, though, because he's got the same faith bane as Edelgard with a slightly weaker list of spells, swapping out Seraphim for the more situational silence. And a lance bane on a male character is a bit of an odd thing, because you have to play against certification requirements to get the best unisex masterclass option for lances. Great Knight does indeed boost lances, and even comes with lance fare, which is why I prefer to have male characters level lances in all the heavy armor classes, but it's something you'll have to keep in mind when training that the weapon rank a unit has to focus on for class certification may not always be the one they intend to use once in that class. Regardless, those are relatively minor gripes, and I'll gladly put up with them and the need to play through Three Houses' longest route in order to max out the most 100% friendly of the house leaders. This tier list isn't looking too interesting so far, but hold that thought for part 2, where I'll be adding each of the remaining student characters. Most of them have the same availability with cross-house recruitment taken into account, so the comparisons will get a lot more interesting when it comes down more to their skill ranks and other such factors. The third and final part of this series will cover the non-student characters, as well as the Ashen Wolves. Those may both sound like a lot, considering I only got through four characters in this video, but now that I've gotten most of the basic concepts out of the way, each one should go by much faster from here on out. Be sure to like the video and subscribe if you enjoy this little experiment and want to be notified when part two comes out. Au revoir!